Hello, my guest today is Dr. Robert Mason. Robbie t lectures in history at the University of Southern Queensland. Now we start module two by examining some of the historical background to the Asia Pacific region. We'll be thinking about which countries comprise the Asia Pacific region and looking at some of the history in the region so we get a sense of place. Now, Robbie, you've conducted research on various aspects related to Latin America. Mm. Now, what have been some of the important historical events or developments in Latin America throughout time? I mean, it's a huge question. Um, one of the key events in the history of the Americas and in Latin America in particular, by which we mean the Spanish-speaking peoples uh, within Latin America, has undoubtedly been the arrival of the Europeans. One of the important things to think about with history is the tension in history. On the one hand, as a historian, as a professional historian, I'm paid to come up with a chronology, uh, with a history of events, a sequence of things that happened. But often when we write those sort of events, we find ourselves talking about famous men, mm -hmm. people in public space. So it's important to have that framework, which is tested and proved and true, but it's important not really in itself. It just helps us to understand the lives of the people in the region. So, on the one hand, we need to construct a chronology and a sequence of events, and as students of history, that's what we try and do. But at the same time, we need to create and recognise that there's going to be subjectivities within that. So different people from different perspectives are going to view that chronology, that sequence of events, quite differently. And within Latin America, I think it's one of the regions of the world in which we see that most acutely and most sharply. So if I gave you a sequence of events uh, to a, or, or to a Latin American and said, is this a true recollection of how you remember things? The answer may be, no, not at all. That's not true. Because we need to construct histories that have a space for subjectivity and a space for women's groups, minority groups, indigenous perspectives to come forth uh, and find that there's actually space in which they can all be true. So there's a big difference between someone's oral history and recollection, which I might go to in constructing that narrative, but I'll also go to the government records in archives. I might go to oral histories uh, of um, non-literate communities uh, whose primarily work through oral recollection. Um, and each of those will come up with a slightly different perspective. Now, as a historian, my job is to create an agreed-on consensus of a sequence of events, but it's a sequence that can't be seen to exclude narratives deliberately. Mm -hmm. Now, within Latin America, we've got indigenous groups that are historically in positions of, of extreme disadvantage, although more recently they've started to come to positions of government. Um, we also have um, the history of the tension between European settlers within the European groups and between Europeans and indigenous uh, peoples as well, um, whether it's between European landholders and the working class, between the sexes within the European groups and, of course, within the indigenous groups as well. So it's a very complex history that's really very contested. And to understand Latin America really is to understand the nature and the interaction between contested histories. Right. And so part of your research, you've looked at trauma. What is this trauma and, and how has it impacted people? Well, my research looks at migrant populations, so people who, for whatever reason, have felt that they've had to leave their original homes, their birthplaces, what we might call displaced people, uh, irregular migrants. And what I'm interested in, how they take those memories of place, the memories of the localities in which they grew up, the landscapes, uh, the oral histories and traditions that they have, and then they find themselves having to recount and reimagine themselves within new localities. Mm -hmm. So we have a lot of Latin Americans within uh, Australia, there's far more in America as well, and also in Europe. And these communities relate back to Latin America, they identify as Salvadorans or Chileans, or sometimes as Latin Americans. Mm -hmm. And we need to think about how those histories of trauma and traumatic experience will impact their settlement. So what happens when you see a, a new story of someone who's undergone some sort of terrible traumatic torture, okay. and that triggers a recollection that you or someone in your close family also experienced that trauma, it suddenly bursts through. And that chronological narrative of history that we've constructed where everything's a sequence of events doesn't happen for traumatic people because often something that you think is long in the past, they can't control that memory in quite the same way 
that someone who's not been through a traumatic experience might do. And so you find it rupturing through into the present in an uncontrolled manner. And that's one of the ways to think about history is more than just the names of dead people and dates. It's personal. It's about relationships. And it's about finding a sense of justice and um, a sense of self within the present time. Mm -hmm. Right. Oh, well, thank you very much. That was very interesting. Uh, now, for students who look at uh, Latin America and, and South America, they might be very interested in looking at some of the civilizations within the region, mm. particularly if we consider that um, Chichen Itza and Machu Picchu have both been uh, included in the new Seven Wonders of the World. So I'm wondering if you could very briefly uh, talk about what was really the, the power of uh, the Inca and Aztec civilizations at their height? Were they a powerful force? Yeah, uh, one of the ways to think about the Aztecs is not to think about them as European states. Mm. It's a system of negotiation within the empire, which there's one uh, or a number of, of dominant ethnic groups uh, which negotiate uh, in a number of different ways with their subject peoples. Mm. And it's actually quite a recent empire. And it's an empire that's under considerable stress and strain and tensions at the time that the Europeans land. Mm. So we shouldn't make the mistake of thinking that it's simply between indigenous Aztec peoples and the Europeans who come um, uh, with, with Spanish arms. Mm. Um, in fact, as soon as the Europeans start to advance through Latin America, we see a negotiation between Europeans who already lived there, uh, often within the Mayan group. There's a very famous interpreter who works for the Spaniards. And we find um, people on both sides. So that ethnic division is, is not really how we can think about it. It's a process of negotiation. And within the Incas, which is the other civilization which you mentioned, which is based in modern-day Peru, although it expanded through a very large portion of South America. Mm -hmm. uh, and the Incas, again, are based on military domination, but it's also a process of negotiation. So often when Europeans first started to write about these histories, they characterized how barbaric, how uh, oppressive, how unchristian a lot of these groups were. And they used that rhetoric as a way to justify their position mm -hmm. uh, and their dominance over the indigenous peoples. As historians, we really need to be moving away from that to drill down into some of the subjectivities of their everyday lived experiences, that no one is wholly evil or wholly good uh, within history, or very few people, um, that we really need to start thinking about people's everyday experiences and the relationships that developed across boundaries uh, as well as within those segmented groups. You mentioned that they've recently been designated as one of the new wonders of the world. Um, it's really interesting because it shows how we're starting to relate to history mm. within the contemporary experience and the importance of history and how we imagine ourselves. Mm -hmm. So that sequence and narrative events and the way in which we imagine ourselves to exist within it, in those subjectivities, whether as a woman or a man or a white European or a Pacific Island uh, nation, we're all interacting constantly. And when we start to think about the sequence of our personal narratives, where we came from. I'm a migrant, I moved to Australia from Britain, it's part of my past, and it helps to inform who I am in the present. It's exactly the same when we look at Latin America and we look at the construction of tourist sites because people use their sense of history when they relate to those. So we can use what we might call cultural heritage as a way to help understand the present and the past. Mm -hmm. And again, we can construct those sites in a way that recognises the subjectivity, all the different ways in which people interacted in those sites through time, rather than think of them as frozen mm -hmm. archaeological specimens. Okay. Well, thank you very much. I think you've given the students a very um, insightful way of looking at history, which is probably very different to what they're used to in terms of viewing history as those big dates and, mm. you know, big people throughout time. So thank you very much for that. And it ties in nicely with what we'll be looking at next week when we look at the impact of Europeans on the indigenous populations of Asia and, Pacific, and the Pacific. So until next week, thanks a lot. And uh, I look forward to seeing you again next week. Thank you, Robert. Sorry, not a problem at all.